Greetings. The prophet Hosea tells us in the sixth chapter, in the first verse, Come, let us return to the eternal. For he has torn, but he will heal us. He has stricken, but he will bind us up. This Sabbath is Shabbat Shuvah. It's a Sabbath of return or repentance, getting back on track. Those who are part of the Sinaitic Covenant understand what their responsibilities are. But now in the Western world, most of our people have a, her have an herit have a heritage. They, we have the Judeo-Christian heritage. We understand, let's say, the basis, the bases for our various societies when they were originally established uh, and, uh, on, on, the, on the basis of much of the morality that we find uh, in this collection of books. And unfortunately, the Western world has drifted away or in some cases been hostile towards those values. And we do need to get back on track spiritually as a nation and as a, uh, as let's say, a, a region. Uh, today is also uh, on the uh, Roman calendar, September 11, 2021. It's the 20th anniversary of the uh, perhaps the worst terrorist attack uh, in, in uh, certainly in U.S. history, if not in world history. So it, it is a sober day. On the other hand, we can uh, take in, in encouragement for the meaning of this season. Uh, th this is a spiritual season. It's a special season. It's the beginning of a new civil year on the sacred calendar. We've had the Festival of Trumpets. There's tremendous meaning in that festival, and I really appreciate that many of you have seen the message that we sent out for that festival, and we've had a good response, and I'm grateful. And I hope and pray we'll continue to have positive responses to these messages. And coming soon is the Day of Atonement. And it is, of course, a very encouraging day, as well as the Festival of Tabernacles and the eighth day of Sacred Assembly. So world history has its ups and downs, you know, and, and yet we know ultimately the world is going to be heading in a positive direction, right? I read the end of the book, and we win. God wins, and if we're on his side, we win. Today, I want to give comments on the coming revival. Comments on the coming revival. This is intended particularly for those of you who believe yourselves to be a part of the Church of God, who, who believe yourselves to be <clears throat> biblically-based Christians. We know from the Bible that before history reaches its climax, there will be a great revival of God's work and intense persecution as well. A revival, but also intense persecution. I want to speak about that revival today and give a cautionary note. Uh, let's go to uh, 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 18. We have different talents, different proclivities, strengths, and weaknesses. We find our strength and then we utilize our strength to serve our, our family, our community, to serve God, of course. And uh, not everybody has the same uh, proclivities. Uh, in uh, 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 18, but now God has set the members, each one of them in the body, just as he pleased. And if they were all one member, where would the body be? You know, you need all, we need all parts of our body. And each one is vital. And if we missed any part, it would be a very serious problem. Uh, I'm going to read in verse 19 again. But if, if they were all one member, who, where would the body be? But now indeed, there are many members, yet one body. Now, unfortunately, we have seen, in my opinion, a lot of divisions occurring uh, in the body of Christ, I think, based upon what might be called a battle of thrones. I was taught a long time ago by a minister that the most difficult uh, instrument to play is second fiddle. 
uh, I think there are there there tends to be a a, a kind of desire a desire to hold on to power, and to be very jealous of one's status and position and, and authority, and uh, unfortunately, when that is challenged, excuses can be found. You know, to uh, maybe we can find all kinds of spiritual reasons, but unfortunately, uh, much of the issue is frankly political. And I, I, I hate to say that, but we did see that in Christ's day. We did see that those who were the elite of that day felt challenged by this, by this carpenter son from Galilee, this rabbi who was not part of the establishment. They felt challenged by him and conspired against him. And uh, in Matthew 11, we, we see that uh, when John the Baptist and Jesus Christ came on the scene, the establishment uh, worked against them. Many people were very impressed by them and moved, uh, but uh, the leadership op opposed both of them. Uh, in uh, Matthew 11 and verse 16, but to what shall I liken this generation, Jesus says? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to their companions and saying, We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We mourned to you, and you did not lament. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they said he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and eating and drinking, verse 19, and they say, Look, a glutton and a wine-bibber a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Imagine saying that about God, uh, about the Logos become flesh. Incredible. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, look, a glutton and a wine-bibber, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is justified by her children. Uh, as you know, uh, in uh, I hadn't planned to turn there, but I'm, for, I'm compelled, you know, Matthew 20, and uh, verse 7, uh, well, that's not the, uh, the reference I want, but the reference I want is a very common verse. No, I'm sorry, it's probably 720. I reversed it mentally. It's probably 720. Yes, 720. By their, Matthew, by their fruits, you will know them. And so, obviously, the fruits of John the Baptist ministry were that many came to repentance. There was a, 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 a revival in his day, and that prepared the way for the coming of Jesus Christ, who, who had a very major impact. Now, initially, he had people who sympathized, who were moved by his teaching, but 120, he actually became a part of his, his uh, church, and I would imagine that's 120 heads of households, so perhaps it was... Uh, many more that were part of that community. Even so, it was a minority, but then, of course, it quickly multiplied on Pentecost. You know, it went from 120, 25 times to 3,000. So there was a, an, an impact of his ministry, but obviously it, it, it God's in control, and he allowed the situation to be what it was. And looking at it from a human, from a human perspective, it would have been greater had the leadership been sympathetic to him. In fact, one of the arguments that Orthodox Jews use today against uh, the ministry of Jesus Christ is that he was not accepted by the leadership of his day. That means a lot, even to Orthodox Jews today, in terms of how they relate to Jesus Christ. Now, I want to go back to the book of Numbers and to a time when there were people who were not willing to submit to the authority of, of Moses and Aaron and their, and their, and their status and particularly in, the, in their own family. Uh, they felt like, well, you were in the same tribe, we're in the same family, you know, why aren't, we, why aren't we in charge? Well, it was rather obvious that God had put Moses and Aaron in charge. Moses being the leader for, uh, overall, the, the, the secular ruler, you could say, the equivalent of, of a king, uh, as it were, uh, and of course God being the ultimate king, and then you had Aaron handling the ecclesiastical matters, the priesthood was going to be, you know, were going to be descendants of Aaron. Now, to this day in the synagogue, you know, that's the way it is. You know, when I when when I attended synagogue because I was a Kohen, a descendant of Aaron, there's certain things 
that I was responsible to do, and there was also certain, you know, certain things I couldn't do, uh, and, you know, and that's the way it was. And then the Levites had their responsibilities, and then there were the, you know, the rest of the congregation, and we, you know, of course, we were at peace with that. But uh, back in Leviticus 16, um, we see that Moses' first cousin uh, resented Moses' status and resented Aaron's status. And a lot of people, unfortunately, conflate this uh, episode with an earlier one uh, because of Hollywood. And I'm not angry or anything, but I'm just saying, Cecil B. DeMille decided to conflate some, uh, some incidents together. He or his movie already was nearly four hours. And, uh, you know, so how, you know, he wanted to tell a story and he decided to condense some things. So some people believe what I'm reading in number 16 actually occurred in, in the book of Exodus around 32nd, 33rd, 34th chapter. Uh, no, it, it occurs in uh, number 16. And I, I, let's read it. Now, now Korah, the, uh, the son of Ishar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, with Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab and, uh, and On, the son of Peleth, son of Reuben, took men. So we had Levites, uh, we had the uh, first cousin of, of Moses and Aaron, and then we had Reubenites, uh, who were related through Leah. You know, they were from the same, you know, the same branch, in a sense, of Israel coming through Leah. And they were, of course, from the firstborn tribe of Leah. And they rose up before Moses with some of the children of Israel, 250 leaders of the congregation, representatives of the congregation, men of renown. So this is a rather serious crisis. A group of leaders come together and they decide, why aren't we? Why don't we have more status? It's so sad when you think about all the history that had gone by already and what God had done through Moses and Aaron. They gathered together against Moses and Aaron and said to them, You take too much upon yourselves, for all the congregation is holy, every one of them, and the eternal is among them. Why then do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of the eternal? No, God had put them in that position. He had made it very clear. They had they had gone through the, the plagues of Egypt and the Red Sea crossing and, and you know, on and on it goes. We're at number sixteen now. It's a lot of history's gone by. So uh, let's go to verse uh, 4. So th when Moses heard it, he fell on his face. You know, first he goes to God. Perhaps he uh, exited briefly while Aaron stood there and, you know, prayed briefly and then came back. I don't know how, if he fell on his face right in front of them, however it worked. But he, he at some point, you know, he, perhaps he went away and, and, and prayed a bit and came back. Uh, but his, his reaction was to go to God. Uh, with this because this was quite a challenge and he spoke to Korah and all this company saying tomorrow morning they, so so God had already inspired him as to what what to say what to do and and he spoke to Korah and, and all his company saying tomorrow morning the eternal will show who is his and who is holy and will cause him to come near to him that one whom he chooses he will cause to come near to him so it's sad that this had to be done in one sense because they should this should have already been clear, but periodically you know Israel had its troubles. Uh, you keep you can read through the Pentateuch and see that un unfortunately human nature, as we call it, uh, keeps coming up coming up. Uh, so do this: take censers, Korah, and all your company, uh, put fire in them and put incense in them before the Eternal tomorrow, and it shall be that the man whom the Eternal chooses is the Holy One, you take too much upon yourselves, you sons of Levi. <laughs> so Moses answers, answers them, you know, appropriate to the situation. And so, as you know, the burning of incense is a type of prayer. So, in a sense, they're symbolically offering prayers. Now, we know back in the book of Genesis that Abel and Cain brought offerings, but God honored Abel's offering, however he did it. But he, he showed uh, Abel that he approved of the offering, and Cain he did not. And so obviously there was fault in Cain. And instead of repenting of, of his sins, Cain murdered Abel. Uh, now here we have the same problem. We, evidently uh, Korah and these, other, these others, these Levites and Reubenites and whoever else, uh, they, they had their, their problems. And, and, and instead of dealing with their problems, they decided that, that they were better than Moses and Aaron, or at least, quote-unquote, as good as Moses and Aaron. And uh, 
you know, you could say maybe you're as good as somebody else, but God had put the, those people in authority. So let's see if you can be as helpful as you can be, as supportive as you can be. Then Moses said to Korah, Hear now, you sons of Levi. Uh, is it a small thing to you that the God of Israel has separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself to do the work of the tabernacle of the eternal and to stand before the congregation to serve them? You know, you, <laughs> Levi had a very important role to play. And then among the Levites, there was a branch who were the descendants of Aaron who were the priests. And, and that he has brought you near to himself, you and all your brethren, the sons of Levi, with you. And are you seeking the priesthood also? What's going on here? And it's, so, it's sad, uh, you know, when people have this, you know, a lust for power, lust for status, lust for prestige, whatever it is. Therefore, you and all your company are gathered together against the eternal. And what is Aaron that you complain against him? You know, Aaron is just a human being like you are, and he has his faults for that matter, you know, as, as we know from the Golden Calf episode that, to which I referred uh, earlier. Uh, but Aaron remained high priest. God kept him in that position. So who are you? And, Mo and Moses sent to call Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, but they said, we will not go come up. So ima imagine the, the, the disrespect here. Couldn't there be some appreciation for Moses in terms of what he had done for them? Uh, wow. We will not come up, they said. You can understand. It's, it's really sad when you read. You know, you, you look in the, in the general epistles how there was a, 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 a Diotrephes who, who was rejecting the, uh, the, the leadership of John. Uh, you know, probably it was, I believe it was John the Apostle, but even if it was a, an evangelist named John, who was this Diotrephes to, to reject him? He, ha he has a book in, you know, he has to, first, second, third John are in the Bible. They're in the canon, so you understand the, the position of John from God's point of view. So who was this Diotrephes to oppose him? And I do believe in, this, in that case it was the Apostle John. So we have a similar situation here. Verse 13. Is it a small thing that you have brought? Now look at what the complaint here of, of, the, of these people. Is it a small thing that you have brought us up out of a land flowing with milk and, and honey? Now Egypt, you know, where they were slaves, you know, to kill us in the wilderness that you should keep acting like a prince over us? They're the ones, and I, I think I, cover, I covered this just recently. Uh, possibly it was... Uh, you know, I, I give talks in the in in Flair and and uh, in the Christian Commandment Keepers uh, venue, but one way or the other, I, I covered. I, well, I often cover this incident uh, of what happened in in in, the, in uh, Numbers thirteen fourteen. You know, where uh, and so it was really the Israelites that brought this on themselves, and of course, may, maybe he he didn't realize or they didn't realize, but Moses actually saved them all. God could have, you know, gotten rid of all of them and started over. And, and uh, Moses said, please don't, and he didn't. And Moses, as, as we know, is a type of Christ, and he interceded for, for them and, and saved them. Uh, Moreover, you have not brought us into a land flowing with milk and honey, nor given us inheritance of fields and vineyards. Will you put out the eyes of these men? We will not come up. So, you know, you're gonna, are you going to pretend this isn't true? Well, it is true, but it's your fault that it's true. He did all he could, and, and, and he also uh, saved you. At least you, you're able to live as Bedouins in Sinai rather than be dead, and you'll be able to see your children. You know, you're able to rear your children and see them grow to adulthood and know that they'll be inheriting the promised land. Plus, you still are being provided for miraculously in the desert. You, you, you can read about it. Then Moses was very angry, which you can understand. He had a temper, but, you know, this is righteous indignation. Then Moses was very angry and said to the Eternal, Do not respect their offering. I have not taken one donkey from them, nor have I hurt one of them. So when they bring an offering, it, it, that's not something for you to honor because they're sinful people. Moses prayed about that. And I want to go to, number, to a Proverbs 28 and verse 9. You know, there are people who may perform the rituals, but they, they don't have the character to go with it. Uh, Proverbs 28 and verse 9. One who turns away his ear from hearing the law 
Even his prayer is an abomination. All right, so let's continue to uh, read here. Um, and Moses, this is verse 16, And Moses said to Korah, Tomorrow you and your company be present before the Eternal, you and they as well as Aaron. Let each take his censer and put incense in it, and each of you bring his censer before the Eternal, 250 censers, both you and Aaron, each uh, with his censer. So every man took his censer and put fire put fire in it, laid incense on it, and stood at the door of the tabernacle of meeting with Moses and Aaron. And Korah gathered all the congregation against them uh, at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Then the glory of the eternal appeared to all the congregation. Well, that would have been something uh, impressive. And the eternal spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, Separate yourselves from among the con this congregation, that I may consume them in a moment. Then they fell on their faces and said, O oh God, the God of the spirits of all flesh, shall one man sin and you be angry with all the congregation? So here again, Moses is interceding for this very, uh, what's the right word, unrighteous community that he had to deal with. So the Eternal spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the congregation, saying, Get away from the tents of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. So God was going to deal with, with the uh, ringleaders of this rebellion. Then Moses rose and went to Dathan and Abiram, and the elders of Israel followed him. And he spoke to the congregation, saying, Depart now from the tents of these wicked men. Touch nothing of theirs, lest you be consumed in all their sins. So they got away from around the tents of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. And Dathan and Abiram came out and stood at the door of their tents with their wives, their sons, and their little children. <coughs> Pardon me. Evidently, they were so now consumed with their own uh, vanity that they thought somehow maybe God would back them against Moses. And Moses said, By this you shall know that the Eternal has sent me to do all these works, for I have not done them of my own will. That's important to remember. Moses was reluctant to even even do it, remember, at the burning bush. If these men die naturally like all men, or if they are visited by the common fate of all men, then the Eternal has not sent me. But if the Eternal creates a new thing, and the earth opens its mouth and swallows them up with all that belongs to them, and they go down alive into the pit, then you will understand that these men have rejected the Eternal. A very severe punishment and a, and a very important example. Now it came to pass, as he finished speaking all these words, that the ground split apart under them, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up with their households, and all the men with, uh, with Korah with all their goods. So they and all those with them went down alive into the pit. The earth closed over them, and they perished from among the assembly. So God dealt with that and honored Moses and Aaron and uh, you know from that point on um, I think there was perhaps a renewed respect although right away actually it, it took time because it, it took more punishments I don't want to go further in, into the situation but this was not the end of the problem the problem persisted if you keep reading until God intervened even further but I'm not going to go beyond uh, just this section today then all is uh, so let's go back to verse uh, 30, 33. So they and all those with them went down alive into the pit. The earth closed over them, and they perished from among the assembly. Then all Israel who were around them fled at, at their cry, for they said, Lest the earth swallow us up also. And a fire came out from the eternal and consumed the 250 men who were offering incense. So the ringleaders are killed, and then those who were a part of the in the leading the rebellion were gotten rid of. And the Eternal spoke to Moses, saying, Tell Eliezer, the son of Aaron, the priest, to pick up the censers and, uh, out of the blaze, for they are holy, and scatter the fire some distance away. These had been offered in prayer. They had been consecrated to God. God used them as, as, as a means of judgment. He honored Moses and Aaron and not these rebels. He consumed these rebels. He got rid of them, but now we're going to take. He's going to allow. He's going to use these censors to uh, reaffirm the point. The, the censors of these men who sinned against their own souls, let them be made into hammered plates 
as a covering for the altar because they present it because they presented them before the eternal therefore they are holy and they shall be assigned to the children of Israel so Eliezer the priest took the bronze censers which those who were burned up uh, had pre presented and they were hammered out as a covering on the altar to be a memorial to the children of Israel that no outsider who is not a descendant of Aaron shouldn't come near to offer incense before the eternal that he might not become like Korah in his congregation just the eternal as the eternal had said to him through Moses so God was establishing how he was going to be setting things up and when God makes a decision and sets things up then uh, that's the way <laughs> that's the way things are that's the reality and we conform and uh, we conform to it now here is my concern um, when Jesus when John the Baptist came and Jesus Christ came the spiritual leaders of their day overall rejected them and partly I believe it was a matter of a ch they felt their authority was being challenged I think that was part of the issue that they weren't willing to come under the leadership of uh, John the Baptist and Jesus Christ. Well, I want to go to Revelation 11. Revelation 11. There is going to come a revival of God's work. Very likely it will come with the ministry of the two witnesses. John the Baptist preceded Jesus Christ the two witnesses pattern is we have an older priestly austere personality preceding and then a more charismatic uh, secular uh, leader uh, and uh, ultimately the the secular leader in a way has more authority uh, but preceded by this uh, ecclesiastical figure and so we have in the uh, Bible at the end of the Old Testament the classic type is a lot Moses and Elijah we have Elijah as the priestly figure. Uh, of course, Moses comes first, but Aaron is older than Moses. But the Aaron eventually become, you know, f f f uh, over time c uh, becomes Elijah, uh, who was a priest. So we have Aaron, Phineas, you know, the typology, and finally Elijah. But then we have also Moses. We have Moses and Elijah. Look at Malachi four. So when we have the end time now, we have two witnesses, and very likely the first of them will be an Elijah-like figure who will come and then the second will come and they'll team up. But the question is, will the leadership of God's church accept this their ministry? Will they lead their people to be supportive of that ministry or, we, or will they be or, or will they not recognize it as the Pharisees did not recognize the leadership of Jesus Christ? They, they, they spiritually, you know, missed, what's the right term, uh, an athletic term. They missed the ball spiritually. Uh, let's go to Revelation 11, verses 2 and 3. Uh, let's, I'm sorry, verse 3 and 4. Revelation 11, 3 and 4. And I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth, these are the olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. You go back to Zechariah 4, and that's now the uh, emblem of the modern state of Israel. So these two witnesses will have a very powerful ministry, and uh, it will have a tremendous impact. And of course, ultimately, we know they are martyred and resurrected, bringing about the, the second coming of Christ. But my concern is, that when their ministry begins, and it may begin with, as I said, a, a first one coming, and then later on a, a second, a younger one, and they come together you know, and team up finally there in Jerusalem. My concern is that we need to be spiritually alert and ready to recognize uh, uh, th that ministry when, when God raises it up and be supportive of it and not just decide you know give me that old time religion we need to follow the leadership that god provides when that time comes and get behind it and i, I just hope and pray that we can be spiritually alert and able to discern uh, uh i'm not saying it's going to happen soon it'd be nice but i you know i doubt that but when it does happen many of us would, would theoretically would still be alive and, at the time and it'll be up to us to recognize it and be supportive of it and get behind it I'd like to go to Revelation 3. 
And it's interesting, the Jews have a tradition on the first night of unleavened bread. You know, that's a night to be, you know, that's Leil Shimurim. It's a night to be much observed. And so the Jews have, a, have an organized liturgy for the meal that night, the Seder, the order. And uh, at the Seder, the tradition is to open the door for Elijah the prophet. You know, the idea is that he will come and announce you know, the coming of, of the Messiah. Well, that kind of parallels this, this verse I'm going to read. You know, the time is coming when indeed that Elijah will come. And then later on, a, a, a second, and there'll be two witnesses. And it'll, uh, God willing, will have the spiritual uh, maturity to recognize them and get behind them and be supportive of them. As we, as we read in Revelation 3 and verse 20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. So I do hope and pray that when that revival comes and when the leadership, uh, God rises up that leadership, that we'll have the spiritual discernment to be supportive of it and to get behind it. God promises us in verse 21, to him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. So these are comments on the coming revival. All the best to you and yours.